Watch this. We'll begin out in Meridian with updates on the major District at 10 Mile project, public concerns about traffic. We'll hear from the developers about the criticism. With so much talk about Proposition 1, we thought we would take a look at the history of primary elections in Idaho. Did you know? Ranking candidates was done before, over a hundred years ago. The Idaho Steelheads are getting in their final preparations before opening night at the Idaho Central Arena. We'll take you there for a look at how the skating surface is created for the season. The district at 10 Mile in Meridian. It's a project that's been in the works for about a year and a half and continues to make progress. It is a 222 acre development that will eventually bring housing, retail and entertainment options all to one massive property in Meridian. Our Aspen Shumpert has the latest on developments in the project and questions from the community. What was once Meridian farmland will be turned in to a new spot to live, shop and gather. The district at 10 miles preliminary plat and rezoning got the stamp of approval from Meridian City Council. The next step is a final plat and construction's underway and we're really excited to see some buildings uh, coming out of the ground next year. The developer, Ball Ventures Alquist, says they chose this property because it's one of the fastest growing spots in the gem state. Meridian growing growth, the population, and then 10 mile with the interchange here that's relatively new and then Highway 16 coming in that's going to connect our north and south. This is the place to be. It's, it's literally the center of the valley and, and we're really excited. It's an infill project and I think we'll really complement everything else that's in the surrounding areas. CEO Tommy Alquist says big names will be moving in to the retail space. Really excited to announce them in the near future. and We've signed several of those. But locals have concerns about the project. Becky Wall says she would rather have more parks than, quote, high density housing. Heather Christensen is worried about overcrowding in schools. And Mark Schmidt says there's already traffic in this area and he doesn't want more. If we put uses here closer to where people live in Meridian, it actually reduces traffic from people going other places. So by the time we have office here where people can work, places for people to live, there's a big residential section here. We'll have uh, places for people to gather and enjoy and family entertainment. It, it's an infill project, so those are the exact kind of projects we should be doing instead of sprawling out to farmland, creating more traffic on the highways. Alquist says they did not do a regional traffic study because it wasn't required. All the traffic studies had been around it and it fit perfectly in that plan. I think a lot of people are worried about Highway 60, 16 coming in and what that'll do. Uh, but there are governments, that's what they study. Uh, for us in the private development, this was already studied enough by ACHD for us to do this project. Now Alquist looks forward to the district at 10 Mile to be the next place people can gather as the valley grows. Again, Alquist says they hope to have buildings start going up next year. This project is similar to the concept of the village at Meridian, but will be twice as big. And Joe Alquist says they actually partnered with the developers of Meridian to bounce ideas off of each other and get some tips about what it's like to have a property like that. So another major question is what will end up being there? A bunch of shops, retail stuff, um, some housing. There's a bunch of stuff. They can't confirm who's going to be moving in there just yet, but says those announcements will be coming in the near future. So we should find out soon. Okay. You never know. It could show up in our backyard. Appreciate it, Aspen. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. So the other night here on the 208, Brian Holmes and I, we talked in passing briefly about the history of primary elections in Idaho. And we mentioned real quickly that in the early 1900s, the state of Idaho actually had a really brief run with what we would now call a ranked choice election. To be honest, Brian and I, our team, we were searching for more details from that era, the early 1900s, to provide you some history and what primary elections have looked like over the last several hundred years. Well, retired Secretary of State Ben Yasursa was actually able to get us a copy of the 1981-82 Idaho Blue Book. And that Blue Book, by the way, it still gets printed. It's digitally on the Secretary of State site. And it contains a lot of great information about Idaho government, history, maps, facts. Really a cool read if you feel like digging into it. But the 81-82 version of the Blue Book had a great article about the history of primary elections in Idaho. Take a look at the abridged history of Idaho primaries. It's a tale of change. If you want to talk about the complete history of Idaho primaries, we better go all the way back to the 1900s. 
Well, start in 1910 when Idaho had their first direct primary law. Idaho was an early adopter of direct primaries, and they introduced preferential voting in 1910, allowing voters to rank the candidates. Sound familiar? The significance is it actually marked the first attempt at giving voters direct influence in a candidate selection. About eight years later, though, in 1918, is when we saw the repeal of that first direct primary law. There were problems with preferential voting, and party disruption became apparent. There was voter abuse using the preferential voting system, people writing in fake or unknown candidates, and then the nonpartisan league actually disrupted the Democratic primary. As a result, the Republican-controlled legislature repealed that direct primary law. And of note, Republican Senator William Borah continued to support direct primaries despite the big repeal. In 1930, Democratic governor candidate C. Ben Ross campaigned on reinstating direct primaries. And in 1931, then Governor Ross built a coalition of support for that new direct primary bill. In 1932, the new direct primary law passed and it was significant because under the new laws, it was dispelling fears of party disruption. It reestablished voter participation in the nomination process. Fast forward to 1937, though, it was the introduction of the open primary system. A key change, voters could obtain ballots for either party regardless of their affiliation. There was a concern at the time for potential party rating. And the first major party rating incident happened in 1938. Deworth Clark defeated the incumbent James Pope in a Democratic senatorial primary, and there was suspected crossover voting in that race because of the candidate's opposition to New Deal policies. In the 1960s, Idaho had a two-year runoff election experiment that nobody seemed to like. It was abandoned in 1962 after extremely low voter turnout. And then in the mid-1960s, there was the call for ballot system for a very brief time. And at that point, voters were required to request a specific party ballot at their polling place. But it was quickly abandoned because there was public outcry about having to declare a party preference. Into the year 1968, that's when we saw a pre-primary convention system that ran until 1971. It gave the political parties more control over their nominations. Those parties could endorse candidates before the primary election. But again, it was repealed in 1971 due to intra-party conflicts, representation concerns, bringing Idaho back to the open direct primary. Idaho stayed the course for the most part until the 1980s, where there was ongoing debate and adjustments. At that point, they moved some election dates around, but there was still a pretty good system here with the open primary. But that changed in 2007 when the Idaho Republican Party decided that they too were concerned about crossover voting. In 2007, the action was started to close the primary, and officially in 2011, Governor Butch Otter did sign a law that gave the option to political parties to close their primary. In 2012, the Idaho Republican Party held their first closed primary election. It remains that way till this day. Great work from Kevin Esslinger to help take us along the timeline. So if Proposition 1 passed, this would just be another chapter in Idaho's evolution of elections. And speaking of Prop 1, you can find all the answers to your questions at ktwb.com. We now have our voter guide up. You can text VOTE, V-O-T-E, to 208-321-5614, and we will send you that guide almost instantaneously. Meanwhile, though, keep those election and proposition questions coming. We will continue to answer them up until Election Day. And speaking of the elections, I wanted to reiterate this. Coming up on Sunday morning, we're going to have a deep dive again into Idaho's fastest growing voting population, Idaho's Latino voters. Join us Sunday at 9 a.m. for an encore edition of Viewpoint, Idaho's Voto Latino. Questions that you have asked all week about ballots, Spanish language, a lot of thoughts that you have about who should vote, who should not vote, voter rights. We touch on all of that this Sunday morning at 9 a.m. And I spoke to the Secretary of State, Phil McGrain, about how voters who are native Spanish speakers, how there's a new way for them to learn Idaho election resources. One of the things I want to highlight is, you know, we've really been pushing VoteIdaho.gov as a resource for everybody, and we truly mean that. One of the things we added this year for the first time is there is now Spanish pages dedicated for voters who don't speak English on Vote Idaho to get the same resources as everybody else does. We do have a couple of counties that will actually be producing Spanish ballots just based on the makeup of the community for this election, and we wanted to make sure they have all the additional resources. So if you visit VoteIdaho.gov, up in the upper right-hand corner, you can check out all the Spanish resources as well. 
We've got an in-depth show that will answer a lot of the questions we've seen this week. You can catch it this Sunday morning on Viewpoint, live on Channel 7 here at 9 a.m. or anytime at KTVB Plus on our app. You can also download onto your Roku, Fire TV, and Apple TV devices. The 208 will be right back after a quick break. Some wildfire evacuation orders were lifted. More people are looking for work in Idaho, and a Nampa police canine is turning in his badge early. Our Jude Binkley has the 411 from around the 208. Crews are making progress on the Middle Fork Complex fire burning east of Cascade. The Valley County Sheriff's Office lifted all evacuation notices for people near Silver Creek and Boiling Springs. The Sheriff's Office says some roads in the area are still closed, but they'll revisit that in the future. More people are looking for work in the state of Idaho. The Department of Labor released its monthly employment data today. The data shows the employment rate increased from 3.5% in August to 3.6% in September. And the labor force participation rate rose from 63.1 to 63.2. The labor force participation rate represents the percentage of people 16 and older who are either employed or looking for work. The Bureau of Labor Statistics has released its latest data on how much women in Idaho earn compared to men. The agency says in 2023, women working full-time in Idaho had median weekly earnings of about $910. That's a little more than 81% of the $1,114 men made each week. Across the nation, women made $1,005 a week, which is a little under 84% of what men made. That said, the BLS says comparisons on a broad level are not controlled for differences in things like age, occupation, or education attainment. Maverick will now enjoy a well-deserved life with his handler and family where he can spend his remaining years surrounded by love and care. We thank K-9 Maverick for his loyalty, bravery, and service. You will always be remembered. They have voted to clear Final 42 at 514 hours. And with that call, K-9 Maverick checked out of service for his last patrol shift. The Nampa Police Department says Maverick had emergency surgery back in May and is now dealing with a recurrence of the same medical issues as well as some new ones. So he's retiring early. Maverick will now retire with his handler and family where Nampa PD says he'll be loved and cared for. And that's the 411 on the 208. I'm Jude Binkley.
Well, we have a live look at the Grove Plaza. Well, soon people will start lining up because tonight is the night the Idaho Steelheads will kick off their season at the Idaho Central Arena. This is again where everyone will head in, where the pregame festivities will be there. If you get there early enough, you might even see some of the players playing a little warm up soccer there, the Idaho Central Arena. So, yes, tonight's the night. A big kickoff game for the Steelheads. They are hosting the Utah Grizzlies in the season opener, the rivals just down I 84. The puck drop is in a little under two hours, right at 710. And this week on the News at 4, Captain AJ Y talked about how much it means to play in front of the home crowd here in Boise. I mean, obviously it helps when we have pretty much a sold out game every every time we're here. And I mean, uh, you can you can hear the crowd in, in those crucial moments. And I, I truly believe that, you know, you, you kind of ride off of those emotions and Obviously, we're very fortunate with how good our fans are here, and you can definitely go to uh, some other places, and maybe the rink's half full, so I think it's uh, very helpful to have such, such a good fan base. It brings everybody in, and uh, we love doing it. I'll tell you this, too. If you don't think the fans make a difference, one of the reasons Hank Crone, who just signed with the Idaho Steelheads for this season, one of the best players in the league, he said he wanted to play in Boise because of the great fans. So get down there and cheer your hearts out. It's going to be a great game against the Grizzlies. I'll be down there, too, calling the game alongside Cam McGuire. So come say hello. I'll see you down there. Again, the players will hit the ice for faceoff at 710 and getting all the ice, getting it all together for the game. It's not an easy task. Have you ever wondered how they lay down the sheet and get all the logos and everything? Well, Tyson White got a look at how the Steelies make the ice happen right With before their home drop game. For the With pucks set to drop for the first time this season tomorrow, Steelheads players, coaches, and staff have been preparing for weeks, and it all wouldn't happen without the right ice and the right ice manager. My name is Riley Roberts. Um, my official title is Ops Technician. My unofficial title is Ice Manager. Roberts has been with the team for three seasons now, making sure the Steelies have a clean sheet. It begins by misting hot water on the cooled concrete in layers. It's a multi-day process. You know, our first day uh, typically will be a base coat, and then we'll lay our white, and then we'll seal our white. The next day we'll come in, we'll paint all the lines and logos, and then after that, it's just building up to the depth that we want. That depth, Robert says, is about an inch and a quarter, or just a bit thicker than a hockey puck. The ice needs to be as clear and as hard as possible so the lines and logos can be seen and so players can skate efficiently. The way I like to explain it is if you ever go to like a nice restaurant, like a whiskey bar or anything, and you get a really uh, clear like ball of ice, if you notice it doesn't melt very fast, right? Because it's very dense, very hard. That's what we're looking for, right? Compared to your ice at home, you throw it in your glass and it pops and cracks and it's super cloudy. That's not what we're looking for. Roberts grew up coming to the Steelheads games and is passionate about making sure his team has what they need. For me, my goal is to have the best sheet of ice possible for any team that skates out here. You know, even for practices, I wanna make this ice the best, flattest, nicest sheet of ice just because, you know, in my opinion, they deserve it, right? This is their job, right? Playing hockey is their job, making ice is my job. He's ready for the puck to drop on his fresh pond. It's very much a cool job. Go Steelheads. Yeah, go Steelheads. Let's, let's get the season going. I'm ready, for, I'm ready for the season. Roberts is also the game day driver for the Zamboni. The Zamboni is the machine that comes out between periods to smooth over the ice. His prediction for the Steelies this season? Well, he's hoping to drive that big rig in a parade come next spring.
the day dawned clear and cold for most places and you can see that is exactly the case over in Sun Valley. We had a lot of the blue sky in the foreground there, hardly a cloud in the sky and that's true for most places across the area, but we are seeing a little bit more cloud cover over towards McCall and they've warmed up into the 40s. Other spots are a little bit warmer uh, at this time of day, but you can see a little bit of that cloud cover coming from a system to the north, but we are just expecting a little bit of clouds from this, not too much moisture making it all the way to the ground. Going to valley spots, what we can expect throughout the evening hours tonight. You can expect calming winds as we go throughout the later evening hours, but it will dawn another very cold day for us. Those valley spots getting closer to freezing once again before we warm up with an even warmer high temperature in most places. So overall, we will continue to see a warming trend over the next few days and thankfully less wind to talk about uh, tomorrow afternoon as well. But we do have to get through that cold morning tomorrow first. So if you haven't taken Taking precautions with some of the plants that you have outside. Another opportunity to do that if you want to prep them uh, for some of the temperatures closer to freezing uh, as we expect tomorrow morning. But here's what was going on in the upper levels of the atmosphere. So we have this low pressure center that brought a lot of that moisture and the colder temperatures that has moved on to the south. But we will have a high pressure ridge start to build back in and it won't be a particularly strong ridge, but it will do enough to bump up our temperatures, get, get us a little bit closer to average for this time of year. So starting tomorrow, you'll continue to see those temperatures trend a little bit higher. And thankfully, this includes the low temperatures as well. So we have this cold morning on Saturday to start off with and the temperatures slightly below average for this time of year. But then we start to warm more so Sunday and Monday with similar low temperatures and high temperatures getting close to 70 degrees. So back above average. But you can see after that, we stay pretty close to average uh, for the rest of your seven day forecast. There's also an additional system that will be tracking on Monday with a slight chance of showers, but that possibility looks to be low for now, but we will continue to keep an eye on it for you. Well, as Sophia alluded to, the weather is changing and we have some news if you're a fan of winter. For the second year in a row, you have a chance to help name a local snowplow. That is right. The Ada County Highway District, ACHD, they are bringing back the name a plow contest and the voting is now open. Last year, people chose four names. Ashton Genty, The Big Laplowski, Snow Tato, and Control Salt Delete. We got some video right there of the Ashton Genty plow putting in the work last year. You can see his name right there on the front. So yes, people also had some other great names that they came up with. But for this year's contest, ECHD says they got more than a thousand creative name submissions. They have narrowed the list down to a hundred. There were a lot of really good names on that list. We do have a, a bias of uh, Flurry Gebert, named after Larry. That'd be a good one. Some other ones we saw, Lil Plow Wow and Scoop Dog. Those are great, but there are a lot of great names on the list and you can vote for up to three names and the names with the most votes will be added to the blade of a snow plow. If you want to vote, you can do so right now. We have the link on this story at KTVB.com. The voting in this race is open until next Friday.
All right, let's get to some of your comments to end the week here on the 208. This person says, KTVB seems to be glossing over the fact that Proposition 1 is more than open primaries. It will eliminate one person, one vote. Ranked choice voting needs to be explained fairly, both pro and con. We agree. Uh, the person who sent this message, I will tell you, I understand you can't watch every minute of every newscast, but the 208 and the KTVB team, we have covered all angles of Prop 1. I would advise you go to KTVB.com, just search Prop 1. You can see all kinds of great action there. A few other comments, uh, if we have some time, this person tells us that, yep, yeah, ranked choice voting used in Alaska and Maine, not California. So Alaska and Maine use it for some statewide races. California has a few municipalities. Uh, yes, they did team to elect moderates, but the party control, there's some questions there. So depends on your perspective. I'm sure we'll get into a lot more Prop 1 next week. Have a good weekend. Continue with us and watch free now on the KTVB Plus app, everywhere you stream.